Thank you so much uh, for this interview. With us today, Dr. Vartui Petrosian, Dean at the American University of Armenia and Professor of Turpanjian School of Public Health, and Dr. Vahe Khachaturian, Epidemiologist, Assistant Professor of Turpanjian School of Public Health of AUA. Good morning and good afternoon, and thank you for joining us. My first Hello. question to you, how are you and how are you feeling? We're doing fine. Uh, thanks for asking and thank you, you for healthy. having us. You are healthy. That's the most important thing. Yeah, yes. we try to stay healthy. Okay. I want to start our conversation by asking you, do you know how many cases, how many positive cases have been identified to the date in Armenia? Yeah, as of today, we have 136 cases, out of which 112 have been related to two uh, separate occasions, which is about 83% of total cases. And we have the following dynamic in the last four days, 16, then it jumped to 33, and then 32, and yesterday it was 26 newly identified cases. Can you tell us what's the spread of the disease as of today? How fast the disease is spreading? It depends on how you look at the, 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 the number of cases in Armenia. I mean, if you look at just the absolute numbers, of course, uh, we had our first case, confirmed case in uh, first of March, uh, I believe. And then, and then of course, uh, as of uh, today, we have 136 cases. Uh, so, uh, and you, I mean, it's it's kind of straightforward to calculate on the, uh, how how number of cases has uh, increased over these days. Uh, but the important fact here is that the most of the cases, that, as Worthy already mentioned, is that it's related to two, uh, you know, two. It's coming from out of two clusters. Uh, so so I think that's important, which is an indication that I think uh, the the disease and its spread is still under control. In Armenia, so uh, we don't really have that many sporadic cases uh, throughout the country. And how does the disease affect daily life in Armenia? Uh, by that I mean, you know, are there any closures? What the situation is Yerevan? Uh, more specifically, what the situation is uh, outside of Yerevan in more rural areas? And finally, uh, how does the, the Armenians? Uh, taking this situation? What's the reaction to the population? You know, on March 16, Armenia announced as an emergency situation until April 14th. And of course, the purpose has been to introduce social distancing to make sure that we don't spread the disease. And particularly, there are significant efforts to protect the vulnerable groups of the population uh, that are considered as a risk group for this disease. Uh, those are, you know, our citizens who have higher age, those with uh, certain chronic conditions. So we try to make sure that uh, they are protected. And the government tried to make sure that there are no big gatherings, um, up to 20 people, and if the number is more than 20 people, then, you know, the government strongly advises not to have those events, meetings, uh, and many uh, places have shut down, the classes are cancelled, uh, kindergartens, schools, universities uh, uh, either are not working or they switch to online teaching. Uh, for example, AUA is completely teaching online. The schools in Armenia tried to switch to online and I have to say that the Ministry of uh, Education in collaboration with the public TV and private companies that provide internet connection are making arrangements to have access to uh, even people who are living in villages to have access to internet and TV so that the classes uh, are aired on TV and they are the videos are available on YouTube without any charge uh, to the users. Uh, so the um, theaters, uh, cinemas, everything is closed. No entertainment places are open uh, uh, to make sure that people do not get together in, in big groups. Another very important question that I, that I want to ask you, the government response, not only in terms of what you just described, 
but most importantly, in terms of number one, testing, and number two, the hospitals and a healthcare professional preparedness. And number three, it's an issue that we are facing here in the United States is a lack of protective gear, protective equipment for the doctors and nurses, and uh, not enough um, beds for an emergency treatment in case if the disease uh, spreads rapidly. What's the situation there? What kind of um, uh, prognosis can you give us? Uh, I have to say all these uh, preventive measures have been taken by the government to make sure that we spread the disease over time and we don't have a huge peak that is beyond the capacity of our healthcare system. That's why these measures, the protective and preventive measures are helping Armenia to have uh, our sick people gradually so that we don't overwhelm the system. Uh, but of course, the Ministry of Health in collaboration with the government of Armenia, they tried to take specific measures. Uh, they started working on this in January. Uh, they uh, translated and adopted the treatment plan uh, suggested by the World Health Organization and a few other documents uh, for infection control, uh, making sure that the, uh, the hospitals are in proper shape and healthcare providers are prepared for this. Of course, this is a huge amount of work in a very short period of time, but the fact that we were able to prevent the first case and then the second case came after 10 days from the first case. So these were all measures that helped the country to slow down the attack uh, of the disease. And I have to say that uh, we had a team from the World Health Organization who came to Armenia recently, very recently, a few days ago to assess how the country got ready for uh, this big challenge and their uh, feedback was pretty positive. They, they were impressed with the work that has been done in Armenia and the work that has been done in the North Infectious Disease uh, uh, Center, the clinic that is separated only to have uh, uh, patients who have the new coronavirus. There are of course uh, different, you know, uh, uh, how do you say, uh, ranking systems that evaluate con countries' preparedness for this uh, uh, similar situation. And there was one, uh, one that was uh, actually conducted by the Johns Hopkins University, uh, which I believe ranked Armenia as uh, number 44, uh, if I remember uh, correctly and uh, which is uh, which is actually pretty good if you if you consider the amount of uh, uh, public budget that receives the healthcare system and i think armenia has lived up to that uh, expectations in a sense that they have been very well prepared as what we already uh, highlighted i mean the, the minister of health and all the other uh, authorities related to healthcare system they have done everything to prepare the healthcare system uh, in a sense to uh, try to, you know, even they have tried to uh, increase the capacity of the healthcare system if, uh, you know, the worst, worst case happens. So for, for uh, you know, uh, worst scenarios. Uh, and I think the, the contact tracing and all those uh, efforts that the health authorities have undertaken uh, those are, of course, um, important measures in uh, trying to flatten the curve and keep the number of cases well below the uh, maximum health care's capacity. I would like also to add, you asked about testing and its availability. Uh, you know, the Ministry of Health obtained the tests uh, pretty early and currently uh, Armenia has enough tests uh, but they do selective testing. There should be some symptoms and also epidemiological indications to run the testing so far. And all those who were uh, diagnosed with having the new coronavirus were isolated in the hospital. And of course, if the number of cases goes up, then uh, the isolation approach will change. 
according to the guidelines and there will be another facility allocated for separating uh, those uh, identified cases who do not, almost not have uh, symptoms of, or have very mild symptoms, for example, one day or two days of fever and then everything is pretty regular, but we have to wait until they are virus free so that they do not spread uh, the virus to other community members. Uh, another thing that I would like to highlight here is about the responsiveness of the government. Uh, we try to provide some suggestions on what else could be done to improve the situation or what other public health measures could be used. And whenever we came up with suggestions, uh, I think the government has been quite responsive. Sometimes we were impressed. Uh, for example, we uh, were concerned that some of the public transportation was crowded uh, immediately that evening, we heard that the government made a decision that they would very closely monitor the public transportation so that there is no crowding, so that there is uh, the, the risk is minimized to transfer the disease within the community. Just listening to you and thinking uh, about the government response, I mean, how would you grade it, like from one to ten? What is it that they what are specific things they can do to uh, better respond to this crisis? Um, you know, it's very difficult to put a number there. Um, when we talk about it, maybe we sound it very rosy. Of course, this is a very challenging and unusual situation. And we're not saying that uh, the government in Armenia works without um, any mistakes. Probably there are some things that could be improved. Uh, but whenever we come up with a suggestion, we see an opportunity to improve something. Uh, believe me, we find ways to share our opinion because uh, uh, several of AUA graduates work in the current, current government, particularly the Ministry of Health, and we are in constant contact with them. Uh, for example, our graduates uh, have had some brainstorming sessions to come up suggestions from the international experience, what else could be done in Armenia. And we created a list and, and we communicated that uh, to the government officials with the hope that they would address uh, those concerns and would move forward. For, for example, we have been thinking about uh, you know, how to identify vulnerable groups and what kind of support to demonstrate to them. Uh, because right now they took already some efforts. For example, the pension. Previously, some of our L uh, older citizens would go to the post offices to receive their pension. Right now, post offices are delivering the pension to them. There are organizations such as the Armenian Red Cross is helping uh, the Ministry of Social Protection to uh, provide uh, care and attention to those uh, older citizens who live alone with food packages and other things that are necessary. These days, uh, there are many, many volunteers, thousands of volunteers who expressed willingness to provide their own support, help to, uh, particularly with the vulnerable groups of the population. Uh, we heard yesterday that, um, that they are working um, of, on finding an IT solution to tracing and mapping the vulnerable groups of uh, people. We, on our own, we're looking at the international experience to see what kind of public health interventions could be developed based on this available mapping of vulnerable people. Why would you like to add? So yeah, I, I just want to echo with what Wart we already mentioned that it, it's really difficult to give a, a, a grade and evaluate, especially at you know at, at this point because you know this is probably not the end of the uh, pandemic and the challenge globally and uh, for Armenia. I mean, uh, it's too soon probably. But what I can say that Armenia has done uh, pretty well. Uh, 
probably there are areas that uh, uh, for improvement, especially that even the best of the best countries are also learning. You know, uh, it's kind of an unparalleled challenge, and that's kind of a new and uh, and even the 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 highly ranked countries in terms of preparedness, they are still learning from their own mistakes and as well as others' experience. But what I want to highlight here, which is, uh, I think, very important, that this is not really one person's fight. I mean, you cannot entirely rely on the government. I mean, even if government does a perfect job, this challenge cannot uh, be overcome without participation of the community of uh, individuals and all the professional organization different parties i think individual mm -hmm. absolutely businesses i mean i mean it's it's really a it requires a collaborative and supportive environment and work uh, i mean starting from individuals responsibility uh, and you know going up and up and up and including the government so 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 i think the final evaluation of uh, of armenia's uh, response what should take into account all those players and how they um, uh, keep up to stay on top of this challenge you know armenians are it's a it, we are very communal people you know we like to gather together we like to hug we like to touch we like to shake yes. hands uh, how is the social distancing working in armenia is it something that people um, follow or do they follow government uh, recommendations you know uh, you mentioned uh, the community involvement um what's the level of community involvement what's the level of involvement of regular citizens what's the level of involvement of nonprofits? and um, particularly uh, aea school of public health what was their role specifically in supporting the government's mm -hmm. efforts mm -hmm. Uh, you know, on some aspects, uh, we are doing pretty well. As I mentioned, when the Ministry of Health announced the need for volunteers, like in two hours or so, in a couple of hours, uh, the number reached 2,000 volunteers and they stopped collecting information on volunteers because that was more than enough. Uh, on the other hand, when we talk about social distancing and, you know, if you go out, if you have to go out, then keep about two meters or six feet distance between each other. That has been quite challenging. For example, if you go to a store, you might see people in a line and they, they stand pretty close to each other. So that has been a bit challenging. Uh, the government tries to send out messages, develop different videos on how to do that, what it means. I would say that the, the, the engagement of, uh, of the communities and especially the public health professionals ha have been uh, very good and very high. And that's, that's something that uh, you know, we are very happy to see in Armenia. Mm -hmm. Currently, we have uh, the students of the public health program at AUA volunteering in the Ministry of Health. As I mentioned, we have held brainstorming sessions with our graduates, and we shared all those messages with the Ministry of Health. Uh, our graduates uh, from different programs at AUA are working in the Ministry of Health and other branches and helping with evidence-based decision-making. You know, two of the deputy ministers of health uh, are graduates from AUA, one from the LLM program, the other one from our Master of Public Health program. Uh, so that's, that's how we try to uh, contribute. And also many of our alumni are translating the existing evidence uh, information from published, recently published scientific uh, articles, translating into Armenian and spreading the word, uh, not only among the general population, but also among the professional public. We try to also translate materials on personal protective equipment, uh, developed multiple posters, and shared with the Ministry of Health so that they could 
educate uh, the, uh, the health providers, nurses and physicians who are working immediately with uh, people who have the infections. We spoke about this uh, a little bit, but I want to go a little bit deeper into this topic about the rural areas and also Artsakh. Uh, you know, in Yerevan, there is, uh, you know, public information campaign, there are hospitals, it's a denser community when people can rely on each other. Uh, hyper, you know, theoretically speaking, what happens to the person in a rural village in Armenia or in Artsakh that feels the symptoms or, you know, has a positive uh, uh, test? How do they get care? What happens to them? Uh, for example, uh, one of the recently identified cases was from Mary. Uh, the person traveled in Italy and as a result was infected with this new coronavirus. The person, um, because there was epidemiological, uh, you know, factors behind it, he was, uh, he or she, I don't know, immediately was uh, transported to Yerevan because testing is available uh, in Yerevan because you need to have a sophisticated lab capacity uh, and the close contacts were identified and isolated. Uh, they receive information on what it means, how to do, what to do, what not to do. Uh, so we, we have at least examples that when it happens in rural areas of Armenia, there are solutions. Uh, of course, in terms of uh, internet connection, um, it's much more widespread in Yerevan, but these days um, it's very widespread. And also, as I mentioned, the providers of internet connection also got united and they promised to provide free access, particularly for, uh, for internet, uh, for educational purposes. But uh, the um, public awareness raising videos are available on the public TV. Uh, Armenian citizens have uh, universal coverage. You also asked about Artsakh. Mm, you know, Artsakh closely follows uh, the guidelines that are coming out, for example, from the Ministry of Health uh, in Armenia. Uh, they also tried to minimize the movement between Armenia and Artsakh so that, you know, we know that there are concurrent cases in Armenia. We don't want them to move to Artsakh and also, uh, you know, spread the virus there. I know prior to this interview, we had a little chat and uh, you said that it's very difficult to have any prognosis as to how long uh, this disease will last in Armenia. But, you know, for a lay person like me and many others, I think it's a kind of a common sense question. Is there any comment or anything, any kind of a, a foresight you can give us? What's the trajectory? What do you expect? How worse it's going to get? Um, what will happen? Well, well it's, it's really difficult to comment on the trajectory, but because it also, you know, uh, uh, it, it depends on the actions that the, the governments and the, the societies are taking. Uh, so, so that that really depends on those things, and it, it, that's the reason that we have different situation in different countries because of the different uh, type of response that they, uh, you know, uh, uh, and measures that they take. Uh, so, I mean, one one thing is that, uh, for example, if a vaccination is uh, uh, is becomes available, uh, especially uh, to a, a big portion of the population. I mean, that would be one way and one scenario where where this uh, epidemic and pandemic would come to an end. Uh, the the other approach is, is probably you know uh, that uh, once a big portion of the population uh, uh, develops natural immunity that would eventually develop a concept known as herd immunity, which is basically if a big portion of the population is immune to this uh, disease, then that would also give and uh, protection to the other vulnerable population who do not necessarily have the immunity against this disease. Uh, and of course, uh, you, know, you know, the last one is that, uh, you know, going, um, uh, on and off with our measures 
until something comes up, uh, such as vaccination. But I also want to mention about the, the experience uh, that we had with SARS, that it, it started again in China in 2003, or maybe not started, but at least the first case was discovered in China. Uh, so, uh, but for example, that was also a very huge problem. It has even higher mortality, probably 10 times higher mortality than uh, COVID-19. It has a mortality uh, rate of about 10%. Uh, but that, uh, uh, you know, that SARS infection actually uh, stopped and uh, we haven't really had any cases uh, in the past uh, few years. There have been a few incidents of because of the incidents in the uh, different laboratories uh, uh, in different countries, but those, that, those have been the only uh, uh, cases that have happened. But after that, we haven't really had any cases. So, you know, there are all these options, but we don't really know what would happen. I mean, that's, that's, that's a question that everyone is interested to know the answer, but it's very difficult uh, to, to say, uh, you know, which one would uh, uh, be the case uh, with a high level of uh, certainty. My final question, probably the most important, what can diaspora do? How can we help? Okay, I will probably start and I'll ask Maya yeah. to continue. Uh, first of all, you know, we have many faculty members uh, from the US and we constantly ask them to share with us any evidence that could help us. So they could help with evidence, um, evidence-based decision-making, uh, with sharing some of their successful experiences uh, I know that there uh, recently uh, the um, the commissioner of diaspora they have also arranged shipment of certain uh, medical materials uh, you know disinfectants uh, personal protective equipment and other things that would be necessary for this condition um, a few days ago they were shipped to Armenia so um, for example, today I also received uh, calls from friends living outside of Armenia because they heard about this uh, fundraising event organized by the Ministry of Finance and Ministry of Health. And they, uh, they were asking for the banking numbers so that they could make contributions from abroad. And we tried to share that information with a wider community so that anyone who is interested in contributing to fight uh, this virus can make their contribution to this special account for this situation. Yeah, and uh, you know, I'll, I'll, I think, I think that uh, I'll add also that you know, there, this. The, the challenge, I think, can be divided into two phases. One is the health challenge that we currently are facing, but I think uh, not less important and probably uh, not less severe would be also the social and economic yeah. challenge. And, uh, you know, uh, on top of the expertise and this evidence-based, uh, you know, uh, approaches that uh, uh, experts from diaspora can share, I think, I think diaspora have a very a big potential when it comes to helping uh, Armenian economy uh, to, you know, uh, overcome all this, uh, you know, uh, kind of the uh, the down uh, that we will probably see because of this uh, coronavirus uh, pandemic uh, all over the world. I think that's when the, the diaspora can be very effective. I want to thank you very much for uh, uh, taking time and giving us a very informative interview. I'm sure our viewers are extremely interested and worried about what's going on in Armenia. And uh, thanks to your efforts, uh, I know we know now that uh, uh, every effort is being made to make sure that Armenians are safe and the country is doing well. Um, uh, we would like to continue this conversation. Perhaps we can set up another interview in a few weeks time to get an update. Um, thank you so much and most importantly, stay safe. Thank you. Stay safe and healthy.